Hey everybody, this is Dave Lover, Vice President of Strategy and Technology for Converge One, formerly Aero Systems Integration. Um, we've got another fun topic today, at least I think it's fun, and maybe that makes me a little weird that uh, I even find this stuff fun. But um, you know, Last week we had a great topic on Equinox uh, deployments and how that went. We had a ton of people on the call. It was amazing how many people showed up, and uh, we're hitting those same numbers here today. So again, we I, I can tell these are, are, are definitely topics hitting the mark. Um, so this is actually a breakout session that Andrew Prokop and I did at IAUG this past year, uh, in um, this year, in what, whatever that was, January. Uh, and again, big packed room. So um, again, I think troubleshooting is, is something that's important to everybody, uh, no matter where you are in the process, right? Maybe you're deploying SIP purely from a trunking standpoint. Maybe you're doing it for... Uh, just connecting adjuncts, right? You, you know, you don't you, you don't buy T1 connected voicemail anymore. Um, it's all SIP connected. So at some point, you have to know a at least a little bit about SIP. Um, and obviously, the holy grail is when you're doing all three, which the third one would be uh, SIP endpoints. Um, the good news is a lot of the troubleshooting is all the same because um, SIP is kind of a beautiful protocol in the fact that I can do so much with it beyond just voice you know and that's the problem with h.323 is it was a voice protocol um, i'm gonna apologize a little bit um i was convinced i had a cold uh, but my wife um had alerted me the, the uh, that i'm an idiot and that i always get this quote unquote cold every time the snow starts to um leave and the grass is exposed so she's convinced i have allergies that might be the case so i'm sucking on hall's cough drops while we do this but i think i should be in good shape so uh, that's the thing uh, a couple of, of housekeeping before we really get started in this one is we are recording this so um, you know, I'll, I'll post it on our YouTube channel uh, that is uh, out on YouTube, uh, and um, and so you can watch it there. And I, we should probably have that up and running by the end of today. Usually, um, if you do have any questions as we go through, over on the right um, uh, on your screen somewhere, uh, there's there's a place where you can type in questions, and I can read those and see what's coming in and uh, appropriately figure out where uh, they might fit in or or how we want to cover those. So that is the plan. Um, so how do we do this? How do how do how do I get you to this point of SIP troubleshooting? Um, SIP is one of the first protocols where you can actually see the protocol. You can actually see what's going on, um, which means you have to know how to read it. Um, and so what I need to do is take a big chunk of the section here and talk about the protocol itself, so that you can see the messages going back and forth and know what they're implying when we do that. I'll certainly talk about some troubleshooting tools that we use. A lot of them are already built in the system, right? You know, and a lot of uh, this presentation, while it's um, it's focused on SIP and SIP is pretty generic and open standard, there are some things that make it specific to Avaya, and we'll talk about those. But a lot of these tools just come right with Avaya. System Manager is one of the great tools that you can use for this, and we'll talk about some of those. We'll also talk about um, the actual process that a phone goes through when it boots up and registers, and maybe what makes it similar to an H.323 phone, and maybe what makes it different from an H.323 phone. And then we'll end up with uh, some common issues. You know, this falls into the, boy, if I had a nickel for every time somebody asked me about this, um, and we'll kind of talk about those and, and um, Certainly, if, if people have questions, um, we can talk through those as well. So we'll talk about these SIP messages um, and their responses. And in the world of SIP, we actually call them methods. Um, but just think of it as, as a, it's a, a signaling thing that happens. You know, I, maybe a, a good point to make here is SIP really describes a signaling concept, right? When we think of voice over IP, I think of two different components of a voice over IP call. One is the signaling. And you know that tells what to do, and then there's the bearer path, which maybe it's voice, maybe it's video, maybe it's something else. And the beauty is going from H.323, uh, which is a signaling protocol, to SIP, which is a signaling protocol. The bearer path still stays the same, you know. So even in a VIA system, we still use the concept of of med pros or or DSPs on a media gateway or a media server. Um, that's the same regardless of whether you're talking H.323 or SIP. So it's literally just the signaling component that we're, we're really diving into the details on. So there's a whole bunch of these, and I'm going to focus on just a few of them. But, um, you know, there's these things that, um, that describe what's happening. You know, so we talk about the invites. 
um, you know, registers, you know, and some really, really important ones that we'll talk about is this note, this concept of subscriptions, and we deal with notifications and, and how do we publish information. Um, a lot of these other ones are important, um, but um, probably less important than, than the ones that we'll hit. We also get some responses back. Every time you send a message to something, you're gonna get a response back. Um, if it's a 100 level message, it means I'm not quite done. This isn't the final message. I'm just telling you that I'm working on something and I'll tell you when I'm done um, with what's called a final message. So, and we get all kinds of these. You know, here's a list of some of them, like the, the 100 trying is a, is, is a very common one. When I'm ringing the phone, it'll come back and say, we're trying. Um, and it's it'll ultimately tell us when it's done by generally hopefully it comes back with the 200 okay um, but there's things like a ringing or a, a you know session in progress we'll get some um, some some things like a, a, an unauthorized that comes up a lot uh, we see that actually as a normal part of of some of the processes that um, you know sit by itself will start out in an unsecure way and then um, the, the uh, the registrar or the proxy in our cases session manager will come back and say yeah you're not authorized to do this um give me some some authentication and encrypt it while you're at it so uh, there's all these things that kind of come along with that hopefully you don't see this 500 uh, server internal error because that just means there's something wrong you're not going to fix it um you know it might be a bug it might be something that's not ha being handled correct um, and I, I used to see this one a lot, this um, 423 interval too brief. Um, turns out that's timer related, you know, and it's a setting to make sure that you sent a message and I should have gotten a response in a certain amount of time, I didn't, and the allocation of that resource might have been too short. I saw this with modular messaging, believe it or not, um, and so certain things come in. But I, again, understanding what those responses are that come back become pretty important. One of the first methods I want to talk about is the register method, and um, this is um, when when a new thing comes into the environment, it has to register with the registrar, and that's a component of Session Manager that's basically, you know, a phone boots up and it has to register as a user, uh, and so we see that quite a bit. Um, it's almost always challenged with, the, you know, 401, 407, um, depending on where it's actually connecting, saying, yeah, authentication is required. You have to prove to me that you are who you say you are. We'll see some examples of, of that. But that when I first got into SIP, that was one that threw me every single time was it would register. It would say authentication required. I'm like, well, why doesn't it do it the first time? Well, that's not how SIP works. <laughs> so um, you, you get a, a, a challenge uh, that happens after that. So if you were to see kind of a high level, you know, um, maybe a phone. Um, in this case, I've uh, updated the slide to show the cool new Avaya uh, J179, which is actually the phone on my desk. Um, and it's going to send a register message to the registrar. And uh, again, for that's the generic term we'd use. In the Avaya world, we call that session manager, right? You are registering to session manager. Session manager is going to say, hey, that sounds interesting, but I don't believe you. Um, could you um, give me your your correct information to, um, you know, who are you, your credentials? So that's that 401 authentication required. We send the exact same uh, register method back um, with the credentials, and almost always it's encrypted. So part of the the 401 message will come back uh, with what's called a nonce, an, an N once. It's a number once. It's a one-time encryption key. Uh, and so it'll say, I want you to encrypt that username and password using this key. And through the magic of PKI and TLS, uh, everything works. And I get that username and password encrypted. And then registrar says, okay, good, I trust you, thank you, okay. And so that kind of concludes the registration process. Another thing we run into is this thing called an invite. Um, and an invite is, you know, once endpoints are registered, um, when they actually want to do something, when they want to initiate communication, they're going to send an invite. And it's, you know, what we, instead of saying, I'm going to place a phone call, right? Phone call implies voice. SIP doesn't have to imply voice at all. So that's why we, we use the term session. I'm going to create a new session. Now, in the world of your PBX, maybe it is a voice call, but um, in the world of SIP, it doesn't have to be. So we can also look at this and, um, you know, if we need to modify any uh, existing sessions, we can do that as well. So again, we might see something like this. The, you know, the SIP proxy is something that's going to pass information. Again, um, the session manager, Avaya session manager, is serving that role as SIP proxy. So um, 
you know, it assumes these two devices are registered. Um, its session manager knows where it is on the network uh, via location services. Um, and then I may want to do something. So maybe I pick up the phone, I dial a number. It's going to send an invite to session manager. Session manager says, oh, I know who that user is. It's on this IP address. Let's send it over to that IP address. The uh, phone will immediately respond with trying uh, and then generally ringing. So it's, it's, it's telling the system um, that the uh, that it's trying to do something. It's it's ringing the phone. As soon as the person on the other end answers it, I get the 200 okay. And generally, with something like that, we'll acknowledge it as well to say, okay, good, I got your okay, we're good. And now I have everything I need to do to um, to to kind of set up the actual bearer path and the media is in, in place. Well, then, depending on who hangs up, who ends the call is the one who's going to initiate the buy, um, which is important because I a lot of people say, well, my call disappeared. Um, I, everything was working great and the call ended. And my first question always from a troubleshooting standpoint is who initiated the buy? You know, and, and well, I don't know. Well, you got to do a trace. You got to find out. And you know, we have tools in Session Manager called Trace SM. And I can actually see the buy. And we're like, yeah, um, in that case, maybe it was Communication Manager that ended the call. Um, it wasn't the phone itself. Or maybe the phone ended it, right? And it points us in very specific directions of where to start looking uh, for, for troubleshooting purposes. Uh, this, this other one we're going to talk about is, is so critically important to. Um, to how do I get cool features on a pretty boring endpoint driven by SIP. Um, SIP by itself has a very, very limited feature set. And so the way we get an enhanced, advanced, uh, via proprietary features is through this magic of subscribing. And um, these are all very standard methods, but the content contained in the method uh, could is it could be very specific to the endpoint and, and the manufacturer. So there are three things that happen. There's a subscribe that actually takes the, um, you know, the, the thing that wants to know about stuff, right? So you, you, you consider yourself to be a listener. I want to be told when something changes. So you subscribe. And, and maybe you think of it in presence, in terms of presence. And I'll, I'll get, actually use that as an example. Um, but I want to I want to know when somebody is off hook. I want to know when somebody is doing something. Well, then you have publish. And publish is the guy on the other end that says, hey, I just changed. And I need to tell um, somebody that I that I changed. And generally, that's um, you know maybe maybe that's the present server. Maybe that's the um, you know it could be a lot of different things that initiate that um, you know that I'm sending it to. But it's the device starts it. So in the case of presence, it's a phone that publishes and says, "Hey, I changed." Well, then somebody. Um, is going to sit there and say, oh, um, that phone changed. Here, I need to go inform all of the listeners who subscribed to the listen state. Um, and so we notify them. And I, again, it makes it really easy to see this one in a real life scenario when you're thinking of something like presence. Again, think of busy indicators, right? A sim similar concept um, where maybe, you know, I've got three end users. I've got Dave, Linda, Becky. And um, Dave and Linda want to subscribe to the call state of Becky's phone. So what I typically do is I go in and I subscribe, I send that subscription over to, to, um, uh, to Becky. And then I'm, I'm now, um, the present server is kind of aware of that. You know, it's like, okay, great. I know who my listeners are. Well, then I go in and I, I say, well, maybe I need to um, uh, be updated of that. So Becky, on the other hand, um, she picks up her phone and um, her phone now has to send a, what's called a a publish to the present server. So it's going to publish the fact that, hey, I'm on a call. Well, now the present server says, great, I am a, I'm now, thank you. I am aware that you are on a call. I have some people that are interested in that. So that's when we send them a notify. So we say, you know, in, in plain language, we'd say Becky is on a call. So that way we could light whatever lights we need to light and everything is good with that. And, and I'll show some, some examples of that. And, um, you know, like message waiting light is done in this exact same way where, um, or a messaging or modular message, messaging or any messaging server that supports the standard of message waiting um, will, will do it, it this exact same way. It'll identify that I need to notify certain listeners. And that, in that case, it might be your phone and your message waiting light. So uh, some pretty uh, cool and useful things uh, that, with that. With, with those three basic 
um, methods, right? The register, the invite, and the subscribe or subscription process, we can do some pretty cool things. Um, and so with that, I kind of want to shift gears a little bit and say, well, okay, let's start talking about some actual troubleshooting tools um, that we might use. And there's a handful of them that I use. I use um, System Manager a lot because I just, I need to check the status of something to make sure, okay, are things working how they're actually supposed to be working um, and, and get a, a better indication of how this, how, what's actually happening. Um, Wireshark is, is an example of a, of a tracing type tool. And there's certainly some benefits to Wireshark, um, but in reality for actual SIP messages, it complicates things because Wireshark is a separate tool. Um, it doesn't necessarily know how to decrypt the encrypted SIP messages. So I, I will admit, I don't use Wireshark very often. Um, I tend to go straight to TraceSM. TraceSM, you've got to know how to use TraceSM if you're going to do a, have any hope of troubleshooting SIP. Um, and there's another kind of version of that. I think we're all familiar with the list trace station command in Communication Manager. Well, not too many people know that I can still use that command even as it relates to SIP. I just have to push put a slash S at the end of it. And that will tell uh, Communication Manager that I want to get a trace of the station, um, but I only want to hear the SIP messages um, that are ultimately coming to Communication Manager. And that's the key, is it's only the ones coming to Communication Manager that I'll actually see. Um, so may, it might be a combination of TraceSM and, and a list trace that, uh, that are useful for you. So if we look at some of those, let's start with um, System Manager. Um, and I see that I've got a slightly old screenshot here, but for what I'm going to describe, I think I've updated the actual um, uh, things. But you will certainly see in that version of System Manager an icon down here for Session Manager. I think as most of you guys know, you don't typically manage or administer Session Manager directly. You administer it through System Manager. So that's what we're going to do. And when we're in the uh, session manager management within system manager, um, there's a whole bunch of things. And I go, I almost always go straight to system status because there's a ton of great information that I, I can um, pull out of here. And I'll, I'll show you some examples. Like if, for example, if I want to know what kind of calls are going on, um, as long as you've done a good job um, of dealing with um, what in the SIP world we'll call locations, Again, this is not to be confused with communication manager locations. Those are two totally different concepts. Um, I would probably think of a SIP location being more like a communication manager network region. It's, it's more applicable in that sense because it's really talking about locations on the data network. And just like network regions, I can specify call admission control. Um, and in the world of SIP, it's actually pretty cool because I can program it to automatically adjust um, you know, um, maybe some codecs. So if a codec changes, or if I run out of bandwidth, I can start renegotiating and start using different codecs. We see this a lot in video. Um, and But the magic here is I can go in and just say, okay, how many calls do I have going on? Where are they going? How much bandwidth am I using? Because that's the beauty of, with SIP, I'm the one setting up the codec streams. So I know if it's a G.722 call or a G.711 call, um, and I will know what bandwidth is being used so I can advertise it that way. The other thing that becomes critically, critically, critically important is the idea of the firewall. Um, and this is still on the same thing. I, uh, you know, I, I went back to the previous slide where I'm looking at the SIP firewall status, but I wanted to kind of blow that up so you could see what we're looking at. Um, if you are using the SIP firewall uh, within Session Manager, and I strongly think you should, um, you have to be careful, right? Because if you program the rules wrong, you are going to start in intentionally, by design, dropping traffic. And what we see a lot is, um, you know, there's some pretty magical tools out there. Uh, those of you that have seen me do my uh, my bit on security, uh, you know that there's a, a, a Python script called SIP Vicious. Um, not to be confused with Sid Vicious of the Sex Pistols, but uh, SIP Vicious is a hacker tool that can launch a ton of calls um, and hack through a, a you know list of passwords. Um, and so as a hacker, that's what you'd use to kind of break into a system. And my computer can do about 70 registration attempts per second in the session manager, which means um, eventually I will figure out your password, right? Is ultimately what this comes down to. And so one thing we do besides having good passwords, not one, two, three, four, not the extension, those are horrible, horrible, horrible passwords. Um, I also need to rate limit to say, you know, Dave's really cool, but he's not cool enough to be able to do 70 phone calls per second. 
So there's something really weird going on here. Um, and maybe we should look for that. So we call that rate limiting. And what I do is I, I find abnormally high rates of communications, maybe invites, and I say, yeah, I should never see more than 10 uh, phone calls attempted per 300 seconds. And if I do, shut that guy down for, for another 600 seconds, slow him down. Um, and that makes the hacking uh, substantially slower. Uh, and ultimately, hackers give up because they're like, oh, okay, they're doing rate limiting. I'm, I'm going to move on. But th those are the kind of things that we look for. But the thing you have to be careful of is if you've created a rule that you really don't understand, and now all of a sudden you're blocking a whole bunch of traffic. I did this, right? I when I first launched my SBC, um, and I had you know hundreds of remote workers. Um, one of my rules right here says um, I want to rate limit an alarm on uh, invites coming from a single UA connection, um, a user agent. That, for, for me and my rule, that meant IP address. Well, for remote workers, they all come from the same internal IP address. It's the private interface of the SBC. So it looked like um, that one address was making 200 calls per second. Well, in reality, it was 200 separate individuals making one phone call. Well, I dropped them because my rule said to. Well, so I quick run over here to find out, oh God, I'm, I'm, I'm the cause of this, um, go fix it. So I'd either adjust the, the rule or I tweak that a little bit just to make sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. But always when somebody says, hey, sometimes my phone doesn't work, um, one of the first places I go to see is, oh God, am I dropping, am I intentionally dropping your packets? And this is great because it'll tell you which, how many, um, how many methods were matched by the rule and how many dropped. So I have dropped people. And if I were to show you why, you'd see that um, um, we've got hackers, right? Hackers from the outside world are, are, are coming in, they're trying to get in. And fortunately, my rate limiting and my secure passwords are, are blocking that. But my, my firewall is doing its job. Um, another thing that can really come in handy is um, when you start looking at feature sets. Um, and this kind of goes a little bit into what I'm going to talk about related to um, uh, the, the concepts are, uh, around subscribing to communication manager features. And I'll talk about that, but um, part of the idea here is, you know, um, like the list, what is it, list IP register command and communication manager to get H.323 endpoints. This is similar concept for the SIP phones. It's the user registrations. And it'll list me every single user, and it'll tell me a ton of great information about them, but way more than what a a, a list IP registered command would do. Um, and even to some degree, a status station command, I'll get way more better information here. So that's one of the reasons why I like SIP is because I, I get better information. But um, one of the first things when I just do a list, it'll show me, well, who's which ones of these are AST devices? And what, if it has a check mark, that means that it has um, subscribed to the communication manager feature set um, and Avaya calls that the uh, advanced SIP telephony. That's what AST stands for. And basically a check mark means, oh, you should get cool stuff on your phone. You should get buttons. You should get, um, you know, on a standard SIP phone or a desk phone, whatever kind of buttons you program, you should be getting those uh, because it is, a, it is registered for that feature set. And we'll talk a little bit about it. But it'll also tell me, well, which of the session managers is it subscribed or registered to? In this case, they should all be registered to the primary session manager. In some cases, I'll have some people registered to, the, to a secondary session manager as well. But the cool thing is when I click on that show button, I'll get a whole bunch more tabs, and I use this a lot. Um, so I'll look at the user, I'll see who I am, I'll, uh, I'll see you know, which, you know, what is my programmed primary session manager, second, secondary session manager. If I was at a branch office and I had a, a BSM, a branch session manager, it would show that here. It'll also show me how many devices do I currently have uh, connected. So I have three out of my allocated nine. Um, and so you can go up to 10, why I chose nine, I don't know. It's an odd number to pick, but I, that's what I did. Um, but if I click on registration, I get a ton of great info. Um, one of which we'll talk about a little later of some of these event subscriptions. Um, you know, so I am subscribing to the communication manager feature, feature set. I am subscribing to message waiting lights uh, from my voicemail system. And there's some other ones we'll talk about. It'll show me when I registered, um, if I've had any interruptions in the registration. So all of this stuff becomes really, um, really helpful to me. Um, the device, I love the device because it'll tell me very specifically what's going on with that device. 
you can see that um, when I, I grabbed this, I was using that uh, J179. I'm, I'm using some of the beta firmware, the 2.0.0.0.44. Um, that comes in handy. We all know that, well, oh my God, that's like a version from three years ago. No, no wonder you're having problems. Let's get that thing up to date. Um, and so knowing what the specific version is, um, again, I, I see the result of that AST value. I can find out what the IP address is. Everything is good. If you want to know, well, what are the other devices Dave has? Um, you know, I said I was currently registered in with three of them. Um, you know, one happened to be in the, the our Minneapolis office. The other two are connected through the SBC. Um, it'll show me what their IP address is, their ports, uh, et cetera. But I think the what's cool is this history one that it'll show me all the different devices that you've connected into recently. So it'll show me, yep, I use the Vantage app. Um, uh, the, you know, 3.3 is the current, did I say Vantage? The Equinox app. Um, the K175 is the Vantage app. Uh, I've got a J179 that I use. I also have Equinox running on my computer, also running version 3.3. So it'll, and I have at home a 960, uh, 9608, I think is what that is at home. Um, but it'll show me each of the endpoints that I have used in the past and what versions they were running. Um, so I think all that becomes really helpful as well. So um, that is System Manager, and there's probably a ton of other things in there that I think people would find to be very helpful, but those are the ones that I, I tend to gravitate to first. Um, if I zip over to Wireshark, um, the cool thing about Wireshark is Wireshark is a standard network protocol analyzer, um, whereas some of the tools built into, uh, like for example, TraceSM, TraceSM is really focused on SIP messages. Well, in the hopes of getting a phone to boot up, I need a whole lot more than just SIP. Um, and so maybe a, a, a Wireshark trace might give me some of that information. The other thing I use Wireshark for is um, if a phone isn't behaving how my settings file was programmed to make it behave, um, my first question always is, well, is the phone actually getting the correct 46xx settings.txt file? And people are like, well, how the heck am I supposed to know? I'm like, well, do a trace, right? A trace will show you. So I can go in, and in this case, I can look at that. Um, I will see everything. I will see the phone, uh, the, in the, the SIP phone, getting, doing a, a, a get command, which is saying, okay, I'm looking for the 96x1s upgrade.txt. We know that what, you know one of the... Um, uh, the very last commands of the upgrade script file is the 46xx settings.txt file. But the beauty of this is, you know, this is just the, the simple command that says, hey, get me that file from your web server or your utility server. Um, and uh, all these things after it are probably the responses, right? I mean, it's coming back, um, I would say, based on these IP addresses, it was from my phone to the server that here's the server uh, responding back with, hey, here's some of that information you were asking about. Now you could go through these one single packet by packet, but the beauty is you don't have to. All I have to do is, is pick one of those lines, one of the packets, and I can right click on the packet and then um, it just say follow the stream. And follow the stream will say, oh, okay, you want the entire conversation of this request. I'm like, yep, I want the whole thing. It'll say, oh, here's it, here is what it is. It's a, it's a, a file and I can actually see the file. So I can see, what the phone requested, and I can see what the, the utility server, the web server gave it, and then I can go in and say, well, that's not right. Oh, yeah, what, what, it, now you know how to troubleshoot it. It's something on the web server. Um, or maybe your DHCP settings are wrong, and they're going to a different file server than what you thought you were going to. So all of those become uh, really important um, to kind of see, to differentiate what you think is happening versus prove it, prove it. In this case, going to a, uh, a captured stream uh, will prove it for you. I'll tell you the biggest one that's most important in my life is TraceSM. Uh, and so this one, you actually have to log into the session manager directly. And once you're logged in at the command line, uh, you know, you issue the command trace SM and uh, notice the punctuation and uh, the capitalization. It's lowercase trace, capital S, capital M. By the way, um, the fairly current version of the SBCs have that exact same tool called trace SBC. And so if you want that same tracing uh, tool within your uh, session board controllers from Avaya, you can get that uh, there as well. And so um, when I do that, it comes up with a very basic screen that says, would you like to start the capture? 
Um, generally speaking, I do not want to start that capture right away. Um, that could be not dangerous, but I'm going to get so much information that you won't even know what to do with, right? It's It would literally show you every single method or, or message that is going into Session Manager. Um, and you just, it's too much. Oh, so you don't know what you're going to end up looking for. So um, before I hit S to start, I almost always hit F for filter. And I use one of these filters. Um, it depends what I'm doing. Sometimes I might be looking for a specific IP address. I want to say, show me all of the um, methods that are coming to or from this IP address. Um, or if I want to look for a specific um, call stream, um, you know, kind of like TCP, I get, I can, I can identify the the thread, um, you know, all the message messages that are associated with the same thing, same conversation. Um, what uh, trace this time actually is pretty cool because it'll color code uh, all of the methods to be in the same. All all of the ones that are associated with each other will be colored the same color. Uh, but for a lot of what I do, I'm, I'm searching for a specific user. So I'll maybe look for my extension. I'll put a minus U and uh, my extension 4563507. And then um, it'll say, great, now what would you like? Um, depending on what you're trying to troubleshoot, uh, I may just go for the SIP message. Um, and that's generally what I do. But if I'm having PPM issues, if I'm having call processing issues, I think in a, a more modern version of TraceSM, there's a couple other options in here. But I almost always, what I tend to be doing is I'm looking at, at SIP messages. So I make sure that box is checked and, um, and I go from there. And then I will only see the SIP messages, methods, um, that are related to that one user. So you can all of a sudden start seeing this in real life, all the stuff that I just talked about. You know, the phone comes up uh, and it registers because it's a brand new phone, right? It's It hasn't logged in yet. Um, session manager says, whoa, 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 whoa. Who do you think you are? I don't trust you. I'm not sending this to anybody. Um, and that's that unauthorized, the 401 unauthorized. My phone says, oh, okay, sorry, my bad. Here's the same register method, but with an encrypted username and password. Um, and session manager says, okay, good, you're, you're, you're good, you're okay. Um, from here, um, you're in, you're, you are officially registered to the system. Um, then we just start doing different things. Like um, one of the first things you'll see an endpoint do is subscribe to the feature set, right? And I, I might have a more detailed uh, slide coming up, I forget. But um, you'll subscribe, and one of the first things I'm, I'm subscribing to is this avaya-cm-feature-status. So you don't see the whole thing here, but um, it's telling me that I am subscribing to Communication Manager features so I can get my buttons on my phone. Well, Session Manager says, whoa, 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 you're not that cool. Who do you think you are? Um, prove to me that you're Dave Lover. So it comes back with another 401 unauthorized, sends, so I send a new subscription with the credentials embedded in it, encrypted with that one-time use number, uh, and that's, okay, good. From here, it passes it on to where? Well, to communication manager. That's who is, is offering up the communication manager feature sets. So that subscribe then gets passed from session manager over to communication manager, who um, that's a trusted link. So it says, okay, that's great. And it already starts passing information. You know, here's some of the notifies um, that are coming to say, here's here's the, the buttons you have deployed. Um, here's the status of those buttons. And so all of that came in that very first notify message. Um, and so again, session manager comes back as the, oh, yeah, that's great, thanks, okay. And you'll start seeing, I get, I start doing more subscriptions and, and I'll subscribe to the Avaya-CCS. I'll talk about these in a little bit here, but, um, it gives me some of that. Now, what's really great about TraceSM is I can pick any one of those and open it up. So I could click on the register and say, okay, show me everything that's in here. And this is a lot of good information. One is it'll tell me where it's coming from. It'll tell me where it's going to. Uh, it'll tell me uh, some of the information about why, what's, what's in there. Um, this is basically saying my phone is capable so it's advertising what it knows how to deal with. So it, it's saying, I, I understand the invite, the act, the buy, cancel, subscribe, notify, message, refer. I know all of these methods because that's part of the process, right? Where session manager says, okay, good. Now I know what you're capable of and I'll make sure to include that. So I'll, I'll if I subscribe comes from you, I'll send you the notifies um, and we can do that. 
We also list what's um, a very interesting uh, field that I use a lot, especially for remote workers coming in through the SPC, is the user agent field. This is burned in by the manufacturer. So when Avaya created, um, I must have grabbed this from probably the old Avaya communicator for SIP app, uh, and it's programmed in to say, hey, this, this is the Avaya SIP communicator. Well, I use that um, because that is a way for me to filter out uh, devices and software soft clients that I don't want coming in. Um, so I will own, I'll, I'll, I'll literally have a, what's called a subscriber flow that says, hey, when you when a, when a message comes in and it's from a via SIP communicator, well, now I know, I know the device and I now have a set of rules and policies uh, that relate directly to that device. And so I can specify all, all kinds of different things. You know, what codecs are they capable of using? Do I want to enforce TLS? Uh, there's a, a ton of uh, different kinds of things that are in there. Um, I have a question that comes that came through. Let's grab that while we're still on this page. Can you elaborate on the IP and names at the top of the TraceSM screen? Um, so those are all, and uh, probably the one that might be more interesting. Well, not interesting. So if there's a name associated with an IP address in communication, uh, I'm sorry, in session manager via system manager, um, I'll actually see the name of it. Um, if it's like an endpoint, well, I haven't, I haven't necessarily given it a name, so it's saying I have no idea who that is. Um, but it's generally the IP address of the device. So in this scenario, the IP address of my phone is 10.11.233.11. Um, it is sending it to um, and it has resolved it a little bit because it knows, oh, you've assigned a name to this, and then, so it's called Bloomington. But it's really associating, I don't want to call it a host name, but it's its a name that you have assigned to the node. You know, So when you think of node names or, or when you think of uh, uh, probably more accurate entities, if you're familiar with this, uh, session manager administration, you build entities and entity links. If there's an entity built, I'll see, uh, I'll, I'll see aspects of that. Um, lastly, within uh, this tool, we look at uh, the trace SM, um, not trace SM, but uh, trace station command in communication manager. I even use the old blue and yellow just to um, give props to the old Terranova people out there. Um, and so uh, you do a list trace station, the extension slash s. Well, now I'll get all of the SIP related messages. But you got to know that this communication manager doesn't see any SIP messages until it gets to communication manager. So it won't see any of the SIP messages that are um, going straight from an endpoint to session manager to a trunk, let's say. Um, if it happens to be using some of ARS routing uh, to get to a trunk through communication manager, well then absolutely it would show up. Uh, but it's the point here is um, don't expect every single thing like a typical trace to show up here because uh, unlike H.323, signaling is not done in Communication Manager. It's done in Session Manager. Um, the only thing I use Communication Manager for is literally the features that we all know and love that came from Communication Manager. But you know, I, I, I think of a lot of this, and I think um, you know, back in the old days when you'd say, well, the, if you were to say, what, what is the core piece of your infrastructure today when it relates to Avaya? You'd say, well, dude, it's a Communication Manager server. Well, uh, that's kind of the old way of thinking about it. Today, I look at session manager as the core. Session manager is the real you know, routing engine. And oh, by the way, I'm going to use communication manager in that process. So I'm going to leverage it. I'm going to route um, requests and information to get to it. But I think of session manager as being the new core of your PBX. Um, <clears throat> So if we think of um, some of the steps that a phone ends up going through, um, we'll, do, we'll take this pretty high level. The good news is if you have a, a J179 or a 9611, um, you know, and it's SIP, it functions very, very similarly um, signaling wise and boot up wise as it does to an H.323 phone. So we don't need to go into all the details. You know the, the, the drill. The phone boots on. Uh, gets connected to the LAN, it's going to ask for DHCP address. Hopefully your DHCP server gives it um, a server address of where to find the settings file. Um, if not, maybe you've got a link layer discovery protocol enabled on your data network. 
Um, so it might get the LLDP messages from there. It'll go figure out if it needs to be upgraded. Um, the only difference with um, the cool thing about uh, the X1 phones is there's a different upgrade script file, depending on whether it's uh, already burned in as H.323 or SIP, which means I can flexibly switch back and forth. between. Uh, I used to be H.323, but I want to take a 96 X1 phone and make it SIP. Much easier to do uh, with a, an X1 phone as opposed to like a, a 9620, because um, that only had one upgrade script file, regardless of what firmware version it was running. And we all know at the very last line of the upgrade script says, hey, go get this setting, which is almost always labeled the 46XX settings.txt file. And then I register, maybe I, I ask for a login or I use cache values, and I start getting that. I subscribe to the feature site and get the, the buttons. And that's where we kind of go into the details of those subscriptions, right? We have, uh, you know, we saw the, the Avaya-CM-Feature-Status. That's where all the kind of the phone buttons, I think of. That, that's where, and, the, and their state, right? If they're on or they're off, or if they should be lit or not lit, um, that comes in this Avaya-CM-Feature-Status. Uh, there's another one we, we saw, um, the Avaya-CCS profile. And that's for, you know, if I need to reload configurations, um, yeah, if I want to reboot the phone remotely, um, I get that as part of that profile. But some of the contact changes, buttons, et cetera. Uh, dialogue is your call appearances, uh, line appearance state. Your message summary uh, is for your message waiting lights. Um, you get a, you'll subscribe to a reg, uh, the length of the subscription, who exactly are you registered to, your primary, secondary um, uh, um, session managers, all that kind of stuff. But you'll see a very, you'll see Avaya's phones all ask for these five feature packs, if you will, and they'll subscribe to all five of those. And uh, like I showed you before, you, you can see it, you can watch it happen from when the phone asks to subscribe to a very specific feature set, right? It's the subscribe, as I talked about earlier. Um, once that all happens, I begin notifying the system about what's happening. Um, so there might be some publishes in there, right? But um, ultimately what comes to my phone is gonna be the notifies. Um, and as before, I mentioned, I can, uh, you know, from the user registration, I can look at the AST device and see that it's been checked. Um, that says, yep, they have subscribed to these features. Um, if I want a detail of that, you know, let's say you're you're troubleshooting a phone that is already booted up. It is already subscribed. So you missed it. You missed the trace. Well, um, I can go into uh, that same device and I can retroactively go say, okay, I have a phone that is registered. What has it subscribed to? So under the device tab, there's event subscriptions. It should list all five of those. Um, so right off the bat, if you say, hey, I'm not getting message waiting light. My first question is, well, has the phone subscribed to message dash summary? Now, if the answer is yes, okay, well, well now we know it's not that. Uh, but if the answer is, boy, it's not even in there, well, that means the phone hasn't even subscribed to it. And there's a lot of third-party phones um, that work beautifully within an, an Avaya environment, but if they don't know how to ask for these uh, subscriptions, then you're not going to get the services delivered by those subscriptions. So this is why rarely will you be able to buy a Polycom phone and have a via buttons on that phone because that that polycom phone doesn't know how to ask to and subscribe to the avaya dash cm dash feature dash status if it did then that phone would be capable of offering up buttons but a lot of these third-party vendors don't they, they're kind of more vanilla sip um, and you're like okay great you're just not going to get the, the features associated with those subscriptions lastly um and I, not, not to say we're done, but uh, our last big topic is common issues. Um, these are things that happen all the time uh, for me. And part of it is understanding how they happen and what I can do with them. But like I think of um, SDP, you know, uh, session description protocol, that's really helping to set up the, I call it the bearer path. And in the world of voice, that would be like a, the codec sets, you know, the codec selections. Um, you know, like, do, do I want to do G.711 or 723 or 722? I can do that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, some common things that I've run into with user, user registration. Maybe we are lacking features on the endpoint. Um, maybe I'm not getting message waiting lights, right? I, I'm guessing we, some of you are already saying, well, based on what we've already talked about, I can make some assumptions, but I'll, I'll, I'll draw it out, make it a little more obvious. Um, and I, some things that I run into that, but to me, they look like problems. I hate seeing errors on a trace. 
Well, it turns out that's just the way SIP works. So it's legit. It's okay. Um, and it's one of these, yeah, they look like problems, but they're not problems. Move on. Um, and that is reassuring to me, uh, at least because I, I just, I love to eliminate uh, alarms and errors and that kind of stuff wherever I can. So one of the first things we talk about is um, codec negotiation, right? When you have two endpoints that can support a certain number of codecs, which ones do we choose? Um, and it's interesting because by default, the Avaya phones will use the codec selection that is specified in the 46xx settings.txt file. So if you were to open up your, your 46xx settings, and hopefully you've updated that in recently, um, and by recently, I'm literally talking probably eight years ago, um, you'll start seeing some of these you know, where, oh yes, I want to enable G.7 of an A law or a MU law, or I want to enable G.722. And those would be, right now they're, they're defaulted as commented out. And when the, at least an Avaya phones has all of these commented out, it defaults to using all of them. So um, you'll see that as it comes through. And, um, you know, as an example, I'll look at an invite. And an invite is, I'm beyond registering, right? I'm already registered. Now I want to start a conversation. So I want, think of it, I want to make a phone call. And so you'll see the invite method coming from the phone to session manager, ultimately getting to communication manager, or wherever I'm ultimately calling. Um, and if I were to open up that invite, I'll see a whole bunch of stuff related to the invite. But one of the things you'll see is this thing called an RTP map. And this is quite literally advertising to the other end of the invite, hey, this is what I'm capable of supporting. I can do G.729, I can do um, G.711A law, I can do G.711MU law, I can do G.722. They're all gonna be listed here. And by the way, this could cause some problems. Um, in the early days of SIP, um, session manager could only handle a certain size uh, invite, literally in bytes, and some polycom phones defaulted to supporting every single codec that it could support. And every single one of them was listed in there. And it ultimately made the SIP packet too big and session manager would drop it. Well, one, session manager has made it so it can handle big SIP uh, packets. Um, but the fix back then was, why are you telling everybody that you can do all these? We're not gonna use all those. So you had to reconfigure the, the uh, the endpoint to only advertise that it can handle a certain number of, of codecs. Now, interestingly, that's kind of what happens in our world now. Because um, you're, you're probably, if you're familiar with H.323, you know that we handle codec negotiation by using IP codec sets, right? You, you, you create a set, you, you tie it to a network region, and any endpoint in the network region starts using that codec list. Um, and you say, well, the guy, what does that mean now? Do I have to do it in the file, in this 46xx settings.txt file? And the answer is no. This is actually one of the cool things about how Avaya implemented this, is you can see the initial invite was from the phone saying, um, hey, I can support, look at all the codecs I can support. But we know that um, the invite goes to session manager. Session manager will go to communication manager to say, hey, I'm, I'm passing along this invite. Well. Then you go, once you're in communication manager for this feature set, this is where communication manager is gonna say, whoa, 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 you, you don't get to decide what codecs you use. You're an endpoint. You're, you're, you do not get to do that. I am the administrator. I am going to identify what codecs are to be used. And I want, and I'm specifying it in my IP codec set, right, the same way we've done it before. And so we actually, communi um, communication manager will rewrite the SDP. So we'll see that the we're looking at the invite coming from the phone, but now we see the invite coming back from communication manager going back to session manager, which ultimately is going to talk to another endpoint. Um, but we rewrote the uh, session uh, description protocol, um, and and we changed that. So the SDP now includes all of uh, only. The things that we listed, we only had two codecs in ours, right? G.711 and G.729. Well, here they are. So um, that changed the SDP, and now I can go in and and, um, and and now it's just doing what I, as the administrator, told it to do, which I think is, is kind of cool. It's certainly cool once you see that in action. You know, it's one thing, well, how did it know to change that? Well, it's in the, it's in the, the packet. It's, it's in the method. You can go look at it. Uh, Another thing we run into, uh, common issues, hey, I can't register the station. 
Um, this could be a whole bunch of different things, right? Um, and some of these are just obvious, you know, and, but sometimes you got to see it in writing to be like, well, duh. Um, you know, one is you got to, is your, is that user or that station actually administered in session or in system manager? You have to be a SIP user. Um, that is how they get quote unquote registered. Um, and you, yeah, yeah, this sounds dumb, but when I was transitioning my users from H.323 to SIP, one of the things I was in flux. So I had some H.323 users, a lot of H.323 users and very few SIP users. Um, well, and so all of a sudden, somebody would try, hey, I can't log in. I'm like, well, that's weird. Why can't you log in? Well, come to find out, I hadn't migrated them over, but they heard from one of their buddies um, of how to, they ask somebody else, hey, I can't log in. How did you log in? Oh, do this. And they're trying to connect into the system and they've they've not been administered to be a SIP user yet. So again, it's real life, it happens, but it's, duh, it's some of the stupid things to check first. Make sure that the user knows what their password is. Please don't tell me it's one, two, three, four. Don't tell me it's the extension. You'll get hacked so fast. Uh, currently, I'm getting hacked by somebody in France. Uh, before that, it was in the Netherlands. Um, and the beauty of, of password management, the beauty of firewalls, the beauty of everything else, um, the, the limitation of user agent fields, I'll make it so that they're not getting very far. Um, so that's just part of daily life on the internet. Uh, verify the endpoint has the correct signaling type. Uh, meaning, are they? Uh, have you administered your SIP endpoints to to use TLS? Again, I hope so. I, it'd be crazy not to do TLS. Um, but there's UDP and TCP as options as well. Do they? Do you have the correct IP address of session manager? Do you have the correct SIP domain? Sometimes the SIP domain. I can't say hopefully. Sometimes, most of the time, the SIP domain matches your DNS domain. But those are two totally different concepts, so they don't have to uh, match up that way. So a couple of different things you could you could do. Uh, another one, uh, if attempting to connect to a station through an SBC, again, make sure the endpoint flow is in there. Um, I don't have a slide on that, but um, in the world of, session, of SBCs, you create endpoint flows, and I am a stickler on do not use wildcards, uh, at least to define the endpoint. Maybe to define the version number, that's fine, but uh, I want to make sure that every single device will have its very own endpoint flow so I can manage specifically who's getting in and who's not. That's me, but um, to me, that's the, 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 one of the best ways to um, handle uh, hacking. Uh, next, um, maybe, maybe the endpoint registers, but they don't have any feature buttons. So I, I'm connected, um, you know, and, and they'll show under the list registered. Uh, but maybe uh, when you go, you know, they don't have any other buttons. Um, well, ultimately, it means that they probably didn't subscribe correctly. So go to the, again, that user registrations field. Go check to make sure that they actually asked for that feature subscription. Um, maybe go into TraceSM and look for it. I don't have a grand answer for it if it's not there. Either the phone isn't asking for it. That's problem number one. Uh, in fact, in the... 46xxsettings.txt file, there's a setting in there that says, hey, it's, is the endpoint that is using this settings file connecting to an Avaya en environment or not? So like you could take an Avaya phone and connect it to an asterisk system. Um, you just have to make sure to tell the phone, hey, you're not connected to an Avaya system anymore, so don't ask for these feature subscriptions. And that setting in the in the 46xx settings.txt file would tell it that. Like, don't even bother asking for the um, the feature status stuff. Um, if it is set and it did ask for it and it didn't get it back, um, that could be a bug um, that you might need a patch. Um, sometimes restarting the phone will fix this, but um, you know it's either going to be ridiculously easy or it's going to be yeah, it's working as described. That phone can't do those things. Um, or it's a bigger bug, you know, so it's going to kind of play into one of those scenarios, I, I think. Um, maybe I log in okay, but um, who knows, right? But, yeah, you know, I'm connected, and I'm just not able to make phone calls. The fact that you show up in the list means that you're registered, right? And, it, 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 and the fact that you're registered means that some of these settings are correct. So, like, the um, in System Manager, when you build a user, you have to build that user, um, set their passwords, set some of their communication addresses, all kinds of fun stuff. Um, and the, for those of you that aren't haven't fully embraced System Manager, uh, you know this one thing is actually really cool. Um, most people who deploy SIP only have one thing in here called primary. 
um, tied to the user. And again, this is a slightly older screenshot. You can see my old uh, domains. But um, the you'll only see primary. Um, I can actually have multiple extensions, multiple communication profiles assigned to one human being called DLover. And you would just you'd click new, and I'd get a whole new set of screens that, oh, this is the Polycom conference phone that's sitting on their desk. Or, oh, here, this is the analog phone that is used for their modem or their fax machine. Um, oh, you know, it's how I can start applying multiple communication profiles to the same human being, which is a totally different topic on System Manager. I think that recording is already out on uh, our YouTube website. Um, so definitely check that out. Um, so maybe if you can't place or receive phone calls, again, you got to make sure, even though I've, I'm registered, um, some of the settings that go back to the phone are, hey, by the way, you registered to me, but I really want you registered somewhere else. So if you think about that as the old gatekeeper list in the world of H.323, similar concept. No matter who you register to, um, it'll look at the, the user profile and say, I want you to establish your primary registration with this guy and your secondary registration with that other person. And you have to build your application sequences and all that kind of stuff, which certainly beyond the scope of this. But um, assuming it's administered right, you know, make sure it's administered right. You also want to see your communication endpoints. Uh, they should be in here as well. Um, you know, and this is what ties the communication manager extension to the SIP phone. And so you have to check a box, fill in all the details, which communication manager. Another cool thing about system manager, I can administer multiple communication managers from one place. Um, so I just say, this is the communication manager I want you to be um, affiliated with. And here's the extension in that uh, communication manager. And uh, you should be good to go there. Um, sometimes you can place calls, but you can't receive calls. Well, the interesting thing here is the way, you got to remember if it's, it's one thing if it's SIP to SIP, right, where it's a SIP phone calling another SIP phone. That kind of could, in theory, at least routing-wise, stay all within uh, Session Manager. But if a call is coming from a non-SIP endpoint, it means it originated off of Communication Manager somehow. Well, the way we tell the system, hey, you don't actually belong in the system. You're actually over in this adjunct called Session Manager. Well, we do that with OPS, right? It's an off-premise station. And so... Um, in fact, when you build a user in System Manager, System Manager will automatically go in and build an OPS station for your extension going to the phone number, and then AAR uh, will automatically route that to Session Manager over that entity link or that SIP trunk. So, um, but that, that's one that comes up like, okay, it's wrong. You know, back in the early days of Avias implementation, that was a step you had to do. Um, but ever since really six something, um, system manager will take care of uh, the adding of the OPS. In fact, like you, you can't even you can't even delete it um, because you didn't build it. Sometimes message waiting lights. Um, you know the key is there's a standard for this. It's RFC 3842. Um, any device on the planet that supports that knows how to subscribe to message waiting. And so all of the bias endpoints subscribe via that standard and uh, modular messaging and aura messaging specifically know how to respond to that kind of, of request. So um, you see an example of, I think this is my, my modular messaging right here in dot 19. Ultimately it got noticed that, oh, there's a new message. I can go in, notify it. Session manager says, well, great, that's not for me. Um, sends it to ultimately the communication manager. So it updates call states. Um, and, and general endpoints, um, and then it might get published back and forth, ultimately getting to the phone itself, which kind of shows here. And, and this, uh, I had two phones logged in. So this is the other beauty of SIP. I can be logged in with multiple uh, endpoints all on the same extension, and this shows that both of my message waiting lights on both phones were notified and got turned on. And if I were to double-click on one of those, and I didn't, which I is would be kind of cool actually. Yeah, I didn't. Um, you could see what is contained within that, that message summary. Um, and, and so you'll see it's, the RFC actually supports being able to say how many new messages do you have? How many old messages do you have? How many are high priority? There's a lot of content that you can send within RFC 3842. It just depends on whether um, the endpoint knows what to do with it, right? You know, in, in most endpoints on Avaya, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a light. So it's, it's either on or it's off, right? Um, it's not until you get to other 
uh, scenarios where I could actually start doing, wanting uh, more detail about what's in my mailbox. Um, let's see, question. Uh, with H.323 status, station command for an established call, you can see the phone's ports, connected ports, set end, other end, yep. Um, and I'm assuming that's the bearer path once that's set up. That doesn't seem to be available through uh, system manager, session manager. Is there any way around that? That's a really good question. Um, you don't see that in um, in the register in the uh, registered users, but if you were in Trace SM, um, and let me go back to see if I can find a interesting like when I first got in here. Is it there? Is it there? There it is, right here. So um, when you are in Trace SM. You know, all you're doing is seeing the signaling. There's this magical little um, letter here, R equals RTP. That's that's our bearer path. That's real-time protocol. In this trace, and admittedly, it's not in System Manager to see what the connected endpoints are. You're absolutely valid. Um, but at least in a trace SM, I can say, well, we're, we're at the beginning of the end of this bearer path. And as soon as I hit R, it would show up and say, oh, there's a bearer path going between this and this. And you'll actually see shuffling happen, right? Because you'll see two separate RTPs going to two separate devices. Um, and then all of a sudden, you'll see those be torn down and replaced with one shuffled uh, bearer path going between the, the two endpoints. So it is actually pretty cool how it does that. And um, uh, that's where you would have to go see it uh, if you were looking for that. Not entirely as convenient as seeing it on the uh, uh, registered users. Let's see, what else? Um, issues that aren't actually issues. Um, we already talked about it. When you see this 401, 401 is, you always like to see a 200 okay, right? And um, when they get a 400, that is an error of some kind, um, but it's a good error. It's saying, hey, you haven't specified any user credentials. I'm not letting you in. Um, and we would see some of the messages going back and forth. Okay, here it is, um, you know, let's try it again. And in this case, it's authenticating for multiple session managers. Um, so the register is coming in in both, in both areas. Another one that it is, uh, it looks like an error, address incomplete. I, I used to see this all the time and it freaked me out because I'm like, well, what do you mean the address? And I started troubleshooting. turns out that's totally legit. Um, uh, there isn't a way in the normal world of SIP to reserve resources um, and to know when something is off hook and when it is ended. And, and so um, part of that is, has actually been uh, enhanced once uh, early media has been enabled. Um, but in the old days, how to reserve that, how to identify off hook, on hook, um, Avaya used some of the standard SIP messages in a somewhat proprietary way. Say, well, we'll just return a 484 address incomplete. Uh, that way it'll go through this, the SIP world correctly and the other endpoint will know what to do with it. Of, okay, we're, we're off hook or we're, you know, whatever we're doing. Yeah. Because generally, um, you can't always use the buy, um, especially if you're, you put somebody on hold, right? Um, it's, it's just all these weird scenarios that you have to think about in real life that are not just a replacement for analog endpoints. Um, so that is our question. Oh, ooh, I've got a, audio is getting choppy. I apologize for that. Hopefully it's getting better now. Um, uh, but thank you for letting me know. Um, and uh, I've got one of our geniuses on the call that has notified me that you can find the RTP ports in the session description protocol, um, which I think would also be in the trace SM, right, um, is where that would probably be. So you can find where the endpoints are going. So Mike, thank you very much for that. Um, we are I'm five minutes over. God, I, if I could only figure out how to do this exactly on time, that'd be great. I'm always a couple minutes over. Um, it turns out everybody stuck around. That's awesome. I appreciate that. Um, this call will be recorded uh, again. So if um, you want to get a replay or if you want to share it with any coworkers, please feel free to do it. Just go to our uh, YouTube site. Um, I, I, for now, I think just search for AeroSystem Integration um, and you'll find us there. Uh, but I'll probably send a, a meeting invite or not, uh, a response to this if for no other reason notifying you of next week's uh, webinar next Thursday, which we're going to do on Breeze versus IVR. Uh, we've got one more session. I think those, I, some of you that got my notice uh, learned that uh, we're going to cancel this series early, um, meaning the end of April. 
and um, we'll probably relaunch it, but um, with uh, the Converge One's acquisition of Aerosystems Integration, um, we're going to relaunch it as truly Converge One using different set of tools, using marketing support to, so that every, everybody's aware of it. But um, it does mean that this series, this, this link you're using will no longer work as of the end of April. Uh, so you can uh, delete any of those ones after April. Uh, but we'll we'll get it started again, get it relaunched, and I've got a list of all the registered attendees, so we'll uh, I'll notify you of the new series once that's relaunched. So, guys, thank you so much for coming. Uh, sip troubleshooting. My name is David Lover. Uh, I am with Converge One. We're happy you're here, and happy uh, looking forward to seeing you in the future. Thanks, everybody.